Everybody be all right? shortages, for uh, empty shelves in our supermarkets, or to be poorer. 
And yet this is where Boris Johnson is leaving us with such abandon. Because, again, it, it's astounding what he has managed to not achieve, but to, um, to, to what he's done in recent weeks. He's made it clear that it's no deal or bust. And that there's no one who can stand in his way. Not the opposition, not his own MPs. He's prepared to throw them out if he has to. Uh, not Parliament. Now, I think the Prime Minister's decision to suspend Parliament, as we've seen in, in the last few weeks, will stand as one of the most dangerous and damaging actions of the past decade, if not longer. Now, that's why, as a Member of Parliament, you know, we had just two days before summer recess. In fact, it was, it was one day, beginning. It was one day uh, in which uh, Boris Johnson made a statement to Parliament and Jacob rees mogg as the Leader of the House, you know, took questions. And I took my opportunity to ask him, the only question I got called for was on Jacob rees mogg to say, you know, will you be bringing Parliament back? Because even then, we knew that we wanted to see our parliament open during the course of the summer. So in terms of like how things have evolved and shifted, it was highly talked about it and perhaps we can give some more examples of where we are working across parties. And you know, I, I worked and I've worked over the course of the summer with a number of MPs, particularly Stephen Doughty, who's a Labour member of Parliament. We coordinated the letter which saw over 150 MPs sign it at the height of summer when it was difficult to get hold of them to say, bring back Parliament now. So that was that was in the middle of August. We then coordinated the Church House Declaration, and for anyone that may or may not have seen that, you know, we've now got close to 250 MPs that have signed that, that said, you know, we must defend our democracy. And what a horrific state of affairs that we find ourselves in, that we should even have to have done that, to have come together, again, in what was supposed to be the summer recess, uh, to say that in the event that the Prime Minister would receive her rogation, we would do everything possible to make sure that our constituents' voices and the people of this country's voices and will be heard because we want to protect our parliamentary democracy. Little did we know that the next day would be the announcement from Boris Johnson that he was going to essentially shut down Parliament just to stifle any debate and to see if it's called the no Brexit. And again, many of us have spoken up for a, a people's vote, for a, a referendum would remain on the ballot paper so people's voices can be heard. Um, and again, we argued against <coughs> derogation. Uh, and it's absolutely absurd that our Parliament should have even Put up that phone sign. I mean, we've seen the uh, that word seen. I so many people messaging to say that like, they could believe what they were watching when we were in Parliament until like it was like two o'clock in the morning uh, the other night. That you know, you saw all of those Tory MPs file out behind all these ministers to go over to the House of Lords to support this prorogation, knowing full well, full well that the majority of them, not all of them, but the majority of them didn't accept or believe that that's what should be happening, and yet they were prepared to do so. And in part, the challenge of what we've seen from all sides in Parliament, and, and I don't say this lightly, is about leadership and about public office. Um, I think you know, we're behind the lines of the decision to leave our parties is because we believe in the national interest. <coughs> we have to stand up for, particularly on this issue of Brexit, we have to do what was right for our constituents and what was right for the country. And again, too often we're seeing too much evidence of people that are bound by the tribal and this of their parties and are not prepared to put their heads above the parapet, <coughs> their heads in the sand, put their fingers in their ears. Uh, and that's fine, but it's not fine when you're one of 650 MPs and you've got a responsibility to the country. So we've seen the, uh, the Yellow Hammer reports, and I know uh, other colleagues are going to talk about that. I won't, perhaps won't reflect on that too much. Um, I need to say that today, Michael Gove um, has um, tried to say that I was wrong last night on Heston. Um, when um, I sought to draw attention to the fact that the Yellowhammer report, um, which if anyone has seen it that was released, um, says that it was uh, Her Majesty's Government's um, reasonable worst case planning assumptions. And in fact, the journalist who disclosed this and, and um, published this in Sunday Times a few weeks ago, when she got a copy of this exact document, uh, it said the base case scenario. <laughs> and I, and you know, in terms of one of the things, nothing's changed. And in terms of, you know, I would receive him because he's sought to uh, dispel that on Twitter today. And he's the one that's not telling the truth, not me. Um, so, you know, we're trying to hold these ministers to account. But they, they, you know, they keep on repeating, I, I say it, lies, they're repeating lies in terms of um, what they have said done so far. We've seen Jacob Weiss mogg <coughs> and dismissed, you know, what was uh, contained within the Yellow Hammer report and attacked um, those of us that have warned people. Um, he has arrogantly been lounging when really he should have been sitting up and listening. Uh, and you know, the, the, the seriousness of this, and we can talk again about um, Dr. David Nicholl, you know, attacking our medical professionals, attacking our judges, as we've seen in this very serious state of affairs. Um, so at the moment, we're obviously waiting for what happens next Tuesday. 
uh, with a Supreme Court ruling. Uh, we're looking to that. We don't know yet what will be the outcome of that. It was incredibly significant that it was not one, not two, but three separate judges came to the conclusion that they did. Um, in fact, I was just actually going to reflect. I mean, if you think about what's been written in the history books in just the past week alone, the list of what has happened from a prime minister that's shut down parliament um, who has wanted um, to exploit the government website to target and personalise data, um, who is misleading the public about duty free shopping, abusing her, um, her tra um, the Treasury Twitter. Again, three judges in Scotland uh, finding the government's decision to prorogue Parliament being unlawful. Um, they've missed up the Queen. I mean, anyone who saw the front page of the Mirror newspaper today, I mean, who would have thought that we'd ever see something like that uh, in, on the front pages of one of our newspapers? We had to see the Lord Chancellor take to Twitter to defend our judiciary. Extraordinary state of affairs. We had other ministers not say whether they would uphold the rule of law and then say they would be deferring to human rights legislation to determine whether or not they would be complying with the law, which is the first time I've ever heard Conservative MPs um, <laughs> 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 uh, I mean, the list goes on. I, I can't read my writing, but there's so many different things about what's happened. And, and, and they shut down Parliament. And they shut down Parliament also when there's been bills that have not completed their passage through Parliament. Really important bills around domestic violence, domestic, domestic abuse, around immigration. You know, we should have been um, questioning ministers this week, ministers in the Department of Culture, Media, Sport, uh, Treasury Ministers, Attorney General, um, you name it. Um, and yesterday, we should have had PMQs. And the Prime Minister should have been in front of the Liaison Committee. So PMQs, you get your one question as a backbench MP, but the Liaison Committee is the committee of all the select committee chairs where they get to come back on the Prime Minister, they get to really properly hold him to account. And he promised that even in the event of prorogation, he would come before the liaison committee, and then he prorogued Parliament and he reneged on his promise. And what did he do instead? He did a Facebook test Prime Minister's question. Um, he was bunkering down in the street at five o'clock in the afternoon for all of like, I think it was 15, 20 minutes. I mean, that's not how we hold our Prime Minister to account. Um, and it's clear that he's very much afraid of scrutinizing some of the basic tough questions. And we have lots of questions to ask, and I've got a whole raft of them, but I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail, but in particular, I just reflect on one very, very specific issue, is the availability of insulin. And I do so have just received overnight an email uh, from a constituent who, on behalf of his son, is genuinely concerned about the availability of insulin. And it's not, again, it's not Project Bill, it's just already there will be people in this audience who are struggling to um, see their full prescriptions dispensed. Either you're getting delays, or I can see some people nodding, um, or you're being told um, to come back, so we're getting half of it now, or some just it's just not available, or you're being asked to go back to the GP and get a different prescription because the drug that you have been initially prescribed is not available. So people are getting lesser, um, um, lesser treatments, or perhaps not the treatment that's best um, suited to their condition. This is what's happening now, and it is because of Brexit, having listened very closely to the, to the pharmacy sector and to the GPs as well. So, I think as this panel shows, and as your presence shows, you know, we're not prepared to roll over. Um, as Heidi has said, you know, there, is, there has been so much more work going on, and it has, I think, you know, there's lots of different things we can point to that have led us to where we are today, but you know, it's so serious now. Perhaps for those MPs or other elected members who wanted to put off standing up to what's going on, certainly you know, to, to you know, their 20, 21 Tory MPs who now find themselves out of the Conservative Party having lost the, or having lost the Conservative whip, uh, and, and again, just two more today that have come forward in support of a people's vote. Uh, I'm certainly doing a lot of cross-party work. I mentioned the Church House Declaration and, and letters. Um, all of that work is going forward, and the, 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 there's various groups that have been referred to in the press that it's fair to say we've got you know, so many more meetings and conference calls that are going, now on, are going on now on a daily basis, where perhaps, perhaps before it was um, not as targeted or not as focused. Um, and in terms of what has to happen now, in my view, you know, we have to see an extension to Article 50. Again, you know, the, the debate around the, general, you know, the, the sequencing of a general election and a people's vote, and why did we not support a general election? As I said, because we're not going to support a general election on the Prime Minister's terms when we know full well that he determines the date and he can change the date, should he wish, to after the 31st of October. So by extension, we crash out on a no-deal Brexit. Our responsibility to the country and the national interest is to ensure that that cannot happen. Now, I would relish the opportunity for a general election uh, and bring it on, and particularly as we've announced, you know, I've recently joined the Liberal Democrats, and there's a very clear policy now which is due to be um, discussed and voted on at the General Conference this weekend. Um, 
and and what the party would do in the event of a you know, winning majority government in the rose article 50. But by its very nature, <laughs> by, its very, by its very nature, a general election is not is general. You know, in 2017, the general election didn't solve the issue of Brexit. Uh, and again, you know, that's why I am standing behind the people's vote, why you campaign for a people's vote, why I agree with Heidi that we're seeing more people come on board every day because it's clear that Parliament cannot contend with the impact that we, uh, you know, that we see. Parliamentarians can't contend with it. And we've got, you know, such a reckless Prime Minister that's prepared to circumvent our, our laws, essentially. Um, so on that basis, you know, we need to have that people's vote, first and foremost, to, to fix Brexit. And in terms of what we can all do together, you know, everyone can put pressure on their MPs. I appreciate that in this particular constituency that might be more of a challenge. <laughs> um, but there are certainly MPs that are, there are certainly other MPs that are wavering. And in terms of, you know, I would estimate that our collective reach on social media in this room is more than five million people. Uh, between all of us here. That's a lot of people. Um, uh, 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 even if it's one million. It's certainly a million. You know, again, we've all got, a, you know, we've all got a platform. We, you know, and particularly in this era of fake news, and we've seen um, some of the horrific stuff that the Brexit Party is is is, is spewing out, and, and it's really disgusting stuff. And you know what we saw again three years ago in the fake news campaign. We can all use our social media platforms for good, and um, we've all got family. And friends and people that you know want to hear what we say and what we're passionate about. And for anyone that doesn't live in this constituency, showing up makes a difference. Yeah. Going to see your MP, you know, I've seen Heidi discuss this before, but you know, we get emails, personal emails really matter, letters matter, postcards matter, but actually showing up in a surgery. If anyone did, this in the, did that in this room, and um, again, outside of this constituency, you can all make a difference because when you're faced with someone, so your face is like I'm passive as a group, you know, as part of the European group, you know, to go for all your different MPs. It makes a difference and it has an impact. And it's difficult, you know, to, to escape when it's someone, you know, right in front of you. So I strongly urge people um, to do that and to continue doing it, and particularly at this juncture, and at the very least to be um, putting forward the plan for a people's vote. Um, but just to say also, you know, we're very much focused on a no-deal Brexit, because that would be absolutely catastrophic for our country. But we mustn't lose sight of actually Stopping Brexit altogether. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the you know, there, there is no, there's no better Brexit. There's no jobs first Brexit. There's no, you know, any, any anyone that's trying to tell that. Unfortunately, you know, I, I, I strongly um, would challenge them. And by the government's own assessment, and many organisations' assessments, there is nothing that's going to be for, for, you know, for the next generation in this country. So we have to contend with no Brexit first, but not lose sight of the eye of the prize.